Fran, thank you so much. We've had, for those who don't know, just before we started recording, we've been just having a laugh, which I think just humanizes us as women. Well, thank you for having me, dear. I appreciate it. Yeah, and it speaks to our character, isn't it? I think if you can't laugh through life, then um, it's not a sign of perseverance, resilience, and just the ability to crack on with stuff if you, if you need to. Absolutely. I definitely use it as a coping mechanism for sure. <laughs> yeah. So tell me your story, Fran. So first of all, who is Fran? And what do you think are the events in your life that have led you to this moment where we're going to be talking about your business, but also you as an author? So um, I, when people ask me that question, I'm like, the first thing I always think of is I'm a mom. <laughs> where do I start? Right, right. Yeah. So what led me into freight brokering, or you just want to kind of the whole, how I got to where I'm at now? I mean, we can start about what led you into freight brokering, but I think there's always a backstory before that. So if you tell the backstory before, that'll give us a bit of context. Sure. So my son, my daughter, and I, we were all trying to put a business together because we wanted to create it. We wanted to create wealth for our family because that's not something that we practice. Um, not, not that I know of, because I grew up in a single family home. And so when we got together, my son, he had most of the assets. And then me and my sister, we would come in with whatever supplements that we had. And so we we kind of went through a couple of ideas. It was either real estate or we would do transportation. And I forgot what the third thing was. A couple of weeks into our meetings, my son decided that he wanted something quicker. And we told him that this would take a while. We were going to do real estate. We can't expect that return immediately. And so he decided to go in another direction. And my sister was like, well, sis, why don't we do trucking? And I'm like, I have no clue, no idea what trucking is. And then she was like, well, I'm in trucking school. And I'm like, what? You're in trucking school? She's like, yeah, I'm two months away from graduating. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then after, uh, after that, she goes, yeah, I also took a dispatching course. And I'm like, what is that? She's like, well, we, we call, we gather truckers. We have like a list of them and then we solicit them to these different freight brokerages or the shipping companies and then we can get a percentage of that. And I was like, okay, well, where's the course? So she gave me the course. We took the trucking gurus course. And um, I think that took me about maybe three months to absorb everything. And then we hit the ground running. I made flyers because my background is in signage and graphics. And so um, we came up with the name called Dispatch Help. And so we walked around at like three o'clock in the morning with these big old pink bowls on our head with our pink flyers <laughs> at the ports, <laughs> passing out these flyers, <laughs> looking like Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> I mean, so, classic door-to-door -door salesman type thing, yes, isn't it, you were doing? Yes. Yeah. But we were at the actual ports with the trucks that were just lined up and we're like, all right, well, we got you guys. You can't go anywhere because you're waiting to get into the port. <laughs> so that's how it happened. Uh, that's how we got into dispatching. And that's also how I got into uh, freight brokering as well. But there's a little story behind that as well, but I'll let you... I mean, that's really interesting. Just the whole thing that you got together as a family and had a conversation, which I would say culturally, um, maybe something that's not talked about. I can speak for myself from an um, African black culture, building generational wealth is yes. not something that's talked about because we've had to struggle so much, have only just probably, you know, gained freedoms, whether it's the end of the civil rights movement, colonialization, a lot of things have happened that haven't allowed us to do so, or even when we do have inherited land from a village, etc., the main goal has been to go to university, educate yourself, um, blend into the you know the society, society that you're in. So mm -hmm. the fact that you sat down and said, "Uh oh, we want to do something different. 
we want to change the narrative. We want to change our, our story and create generational wealth. I mean, that's if that's a trailblazer tip over there for people to have those conversations, I think is pretty, pretty good. But your background, so you said is back as graphics and, and signage. So how, yeah, how did your sister then think, well, it would be great to do business with you. Who has the business acumen then from the both of you? I do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a lot of experience in project management. Um, I worked with quite a few uh, small businesses. Uh, whenever I worked with these companies, people would always tell me, do you own the company? I'm not, no, I'm just taking ownership of the position that I'm in. If I don't, who is going to? So it was through working with those small businesses, I've learned how to do accounting. I've learned how to do all the, the back work in order to make a business flow. Yeah. And, and what have been some of the challenges you've experienced with, with this business so far? Before we so talk about this, the successes. Sure, sure, sure. So with dispatching, um, a couple of months in, when, let me tell you how we actually got started prior to all this happening. So I was telling my sister to marketing, hey, I think we need to go to a trade show. So we ended up going to a trade show called She Trucking. And I felt within myself, and I feel like that's kind of one of the things that we miss as people is that we need to listen to our intuition. So within myself, I said, man, I think we really need to go and let's just book this, this uh, 10 by 10 so that we can have a booth there at, at the trucking show. So we did, once again, like I said, because of my background, I had created some shirts there and then, um, oh, we came up with a, um, a trucking line for women called She Class A. And so I utilized that trucking brand in order for us to promote our company called Dispatch Help. So we took t-shirts, we took canvas bags, and then my little flyers, and of course my little Mickey Mouse thing so I could stand out in the crowd. <laughs> and we ended up, well, she didn't go, but I told her that I was going. And so I did the show by myself and I ended up meeting a couple of people there. One is Brianne from Expediters and then it's Tony from Swinton Transportation. And then I also met uh, Simone uh, from My Enterprise. Well, come to find out, uh, Brianne, he had like this whole network of uh, vans. Uh, what do you call those? What do you call those vans that um, everybody has? Those like high roof vans? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So cargo vans. And so come to find out that cargo vans are one of the hardest vehicles to dispatch because they're a dime a dozen. You really have to be on the boots, on the ground running in order for you to find clients, according to what was told to me. Mind you, once again, my background wasn't transportation. I just know how to hustle. I just know how to call. I'm not afraid to talk to people. And so I ended up connecting with Tony, who was a cargo van driver, and he is also an owner operator. I didn't know that Tony also had a platform on YouTube and Instagram where there were lots of people that are following him because he writes songs about transportation. It sounds funny. But it 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 it's isn't. Yeah. Yes, yes. And he just talks about the different struggles he's experiencing while he's in there, or he talks about the money, or he talks about what his thoughts are while he's driving. And I'll send you a link of it. But it is he's called T Swin, and that you wouldn't. Genius. Oh my God, it is so genius. Yeah. And anyways, he had um shouted me out on a social media platform. And then I had an influx of carriers reach out to me and my sister. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> mind you, we had just finished setting up all of our forms so we can do an intake. And so I was calling my sister. I may have been a little bit incessant, maybe a lot of it. <laughs> so you went to this trade show, not just to, you are really on that networking tip. You're like, I'm going to have conversations with people. And that is, that's really where your first, you know, big deals and so on then stand out by you just 
talking to people. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I ran into so many people, even, um, what's her name? Uh, they call her Shaq and she's from Agate Solutions. And like, she is a big deal in trucking. And I didn't think that I would meet, you know, people with that. I didn't know she was connected to that game. I was just, I just saw her on Truck Truck and Hustle, which is one of the largest uh, podcasts for mm -hmm. the trucking community. And I'm like, is that Shaq? Oh my God, that's Shaq. I'm like starstruck. <laughs> you know, people get excited over Beyonce. I'm like, that has nothing to do with my pockets. <laughs> This one does because they could yes. be something happening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, they could check. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's, it's just she is so knowledgeable that it's really insane. When you think about like gurus for different industries, she's one of them for the trucking industry. And we and talked about it before. The... Yeah. And we talked about it before the um, podcast started because I was reading on women who are not in the business of trucking, but women who are truckers, which is obviously a different sector. And it's oh. not really uh, one that's dominated by women, but the business of trucking, you said there are so many, you know, um, successful women doing business in, in your area that you just think, wow, it's something that we also need to educate our young girls out there that there's something else they can go into. You know, oh, not just a classic, oh, be an accountant, be a nurse, be a doctor, be it. Not everybody can be that. There is another industry out there. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to finish my story for what happened, the struggle. Yes. Yes. May I? Go on. Okay. So when the influx of drivers came in, um, I was telling my sister, hey, make sure that we have everything in tag, make sure we have all of their insurance information. So she was doing some of the back end because I was still working full time at this time. Mm -hmm. And so I would call her frequently just to make sure that we're on top of things. And during that week, when the drivers were coming in, she ended up ghosting me. Yes. Okay. Wow. So, yes. So what, what do you do then? <laughs> So when she ghosted me, like I was calling and I was like thinking, oh, you know, maybe there's something going on with the phone. You know, there's all kinds of things running through my mind. So after she didn't answer for three days, I just figured that this was a sign either I'm going to put up or shut up. So I put up and I started to at the same time as I was working, I was looking for loads for the drivers that we had already secured. And so I would do that at the same time boy, was that kicking my behind. And so that's what I did. I did that until I was trying to figure out what to do after that. And mm -hmm. because of that, I ended, I had ended up running into the neighbor who I had seen had all these trucks going by. And I was thinking, oh, maybe I can dispatch his trucks. And then when we, when I meet with him, he's like, do you have any experience in trucking? I was like, no, nope, but I know how to hustle. And he's like, man, you got some balls. And I was just like, I've heard that before. <laughs> so he said that he needed a partner because he wanted to open up a freight brokerage, but he didn't have anybody to help him. So I said, I'm with it. So I had became partner with him at All American Port Logistics and still doing dispatch help at the time. But at least I was able to do, you know, both because of that opportunity so and leverage but, all the contacts you'd gotten at the time i guess yes, isn't it yeah. Yes, yeah yeah i actually before i left the owner of the previous company he wanted me to stay and become a partner with him at his at the signage company but i felt like i had already experienced everything that i needed experience there i already had to hit a plateau in signage for what what i i felt and so I couldn't learn anything further. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to expand and grow. Yeah, you you, you saw an opportunity and, and there was an interest there. But girl, I mean, when you've been ghosted that way, that that could have gone two different ways. You could have just said, look, this is not for me. This is not happening. But you, what type of resilience or what trait or, or, or character do you think you have in you that just made you say, 
I'm just going to make this happen? Well, on my daily job, I do project management and I'm sure that you're familiar with project management. You just have to figure out how to put out fires when they come. So I just figured this is probably just one of those things. And I'm assuming my sister maybe may not have had that experience. And so it may have been overwhelming for her. And so I just said, I got it. I put in all this time and effort. Nobody's going to take this away from me. I don't care who it is. So I just went. Okay. <laughs> so I think the resilience. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the resilience really comes from my sales background. When they say people always are telling you no, you're like, okay, great. Next, let's keep it pushing. So I think that's really where that comes from. And I've always had a drive to want to become my own um, my own company. So I think that really was a catalyst for me to push me into where I am today. Yeah, yeah. And do you think that drive stems from from your childhood? Because you said you come from a single parent household. So obviously seeing the struggle there may have been a catalyst or? Oh, absolutely. That was definitely one of the factors. And because, so when I grew up in our household, my mom was on, what do you call that? Like food stamps, cash aid, things of that nature. Yeah. And it always seemed like we had a shortage at home and I really hated it. And we always seemed to live with people and we never really had our own place to stay. And so observing those things made me really want to take my life in another direction. Like I want to have food in my house consistently. Um, I want to make sure that my kids have a, a place that is consistent. They can, they can call home. And because we moved so much, people thought that we were in the army and, and I wanted my kids to have long lasting friendships. And uh, so I've only moved like maybe three times in my adult life versus when I was a kid, I was in maybe like maybe 15 different districts all up and down the coast of California. Wow. That's that's really interesting and, and good to see that you've just taken the positive out of it. But I was just thinking, so it means you know California really well it, it, from, from a dispatching business so. perspective. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> That's the <an> upside. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. You know Cali really well. That's, it's, it's really interesting how our early experiences shape us and you, it can go in one of two directions. And you've used it as a catalyst to say, these are the, this is how I don't want my life to be. And these are the, these are the three non-negotiables for how my life uh, should be moving forward. Yeah, I didn't even realize I had non-negotiables at that time, but definitely. <laughs> you you realize it when you when you're looking back, isn't it? Reflecting on 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 your life. So, how long have you had then this business? So, obviously pivoting from graphics and so on. How long have you been in in this um, industry then? So, I've been in this industry for almost no, for 2 years. Wow. Yep. 2 years. Crazy. Can't believe how fast the time flies. It started with COVID. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is it, it Has yeah. it been your post-pandemic or post-COVID um, pivot success story? Yeah, yeah. So I think we started in 2020. And then as we were doing dispatching, that's when I ran into uh, my partner, my business partner now. And so I guess three years total. Yeah. And enjoying it still? I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> It is definitely it is definitely paying the bills. I'm really grateful that um for this it was a low barrier to entry. Yeah. Yeah, so for doing freight brokering and dispatching, you just need the basic necessities, you know, setting up your LLC, things of that nature. All you really need to do is the hustle of it, making the calls, not being afraid to hear no doing little flyers, which you can, you know, do on Fiverr and those things of that nature. Mm. Just, yeah. You, and then also too, with the freight broker, you just have to set up your security bonds and things like that, insurance. So 
So as long as you have those basics covered, you should be fine if you're continuing to, you know, make the calls to have the business come in consistently. Yeah. And it's good that you've mentioned that because I think a lot of the time, you know, we were talking about it earlier about how social media is just painting such a very different picture. You still have to do the work. Like yeah. that checklist you just run through. Those are the basics. Yes, yep. there is a low barrier to entry, but in order for you to actually make a profit, you know, when you're looking at your balance sheet, all of these things that you've just met run down have to be done. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So I think that, that's a valuable lesson. Yeah. I think people have this, like you said, in social media, oh yeah, this is what this looks like. You're going to make this much money. Um, how long did it take for you to get there? <laughs> and then what contacts did you utilize to get there? So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So do you still do trade shows as, as well? Is that something that you still do then as, as part of the business? Yeah. Yes. I'm actually, I will be at a trade show on the 20th and 21st at the business expo in Los Angeles. So that will be for a freight brokerage. So I won't have my little Mickey mouse ears. So it won't be that easy to find me. <laughs> But you've just plugged it. So we'll put it in the show notes so people will okay. can come and have, have a chat. Definitely. But look, Thank you've you evolved you've from your little hat. Yep, yep. I'll just have this big old red circle. Yeah. <laughs> That's our uh, logo. Amazing. Yeah. amazing. I, think I came up with a little slogan to put on the back. I'm going to put a QR code and I put scan me if you can. So if they try to scan me, I'm going to run away. You, you know, it's all these little things that you just need to pick up and, and go away with, you know? You don't want to have lots of paperwork for people to fill out. If it's a QR code, they can scan and, yeah. you know, you, you, you get their contacts that way. You get your leads, then yeah. you're brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Don't lose them, like you said, paperwork. <laughs> so you've shared just quite a bit, I mean, having such a, a colorful um, uh, career and, and transi transitioning into, <laughs> into other things. You're also an author. So yes. what made you decide to say, you know what, I'd love to write a book and actually do it, write the book. So initially when I was writing a book, um, a gentleman that I used to date who was Nigerian, he had said that I should write about my experiences and I did, but it didn't quite work out that way. It wasn't until my youngest, I think she was like maybe 14 at the time. I don't know if teenagers go through a phase, but I was definitely experiencing uh, some friction at this time in, in our life. She wouldn't listen to me. Like when I would tell her something to do, she would talk back. And for, I think a lot of, for, for a lot of, uh, quote unquote minorities or communities of color, that kind of behavior isn't acceptable. And so my first thought was revert to how you were raised when you were younger, which in a Pacific Islander household, everything was corporal punishment. The answer to everything was fear, was, was created through fear. If you're listening, it's because I told you so. There is no dialogue of, hey, can I do this? There isn't any asking. There's, I speak, you do, go complete the task and come back. Is that the same with your experience? growing up? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think it all stems from, um, you know, the hierarchy of, of culture. So your traditions and yes. your parents are the head of the household. Um, and it's interesting when, when I was growing up, I thought my parents were just too strict. I just thought, mm. surely you need to let me live a little because what's the purpose of all of it. But now in hindsight, when, when I look back, you know, and say, I, I understand. So my parents grew up in, in, in three different ways. So they grew up during colonialism. So where there was segregation, where they weren't allowed to go to certain parts of what's known as Rhodesia, unless you had a pass. Mm. And then their family didn't go to um, school. So they wanted to go to university. They were the first ones to go to university. And also um, in order for you to travel or work in, in European or American or Asian countries, usually careers that you should have done are the classic doctor, lawyer, engineer, because they open up doors in terms of the type of visas you could get. So when I now hear everything that they went through, I, I understand 
why they were why they were so strict and why they but on the other hand I have two boys I've I've done a combination of, of both where I'm strict but I'm also trying to communicate trying to be more open let them actually have curfews let them exp- I'm, I'm trying to do both but also realizing okay I've got black boys I also need to school them on what potentially could happen to them so I'm mm-hmm. sort of torn and I understand why our parents probably just chose the let's just keep it real and strict and hardcore but right. I think there is there is a way to evolve to parent to match the society that we're in now yes yeah. absolutely yeah yeah and I had to also take that into consideration too like what we we're talking about how I grew up, especially like with there being, um, I don't know if I mentioned the emotional connection between me and my mother, because that connection also too affected the way that I parented. Mm. So my mom was emotionally unavailable. And like you said, we have to understand where they come from in order for us to have some type of empathy. And as you mentioned earlier, we do have, or there will be opportunities for us to adjust ourselves to the society that we live in now in order to create more of a dynamic between us and our children. So I lost my train of thought. <laughs> About why you wrote the book. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So it was the dynamic that I, that was occurring between me and my 14 year old that I couldn't marry the culture of how I had grown up with how she was trying to explain how she wanted to connect with me as a parent. And because she gave me so much pushback, I really had to look at myself Mm -hmm. and figure out how this dynamic would work. But it really didn't hit home until that same week, like an incident like that happened at work. Another incident happened with my best friend, which made me all come circle back to what had happened with my daughter. And I had to really do some deep diving into self. And that's how I started writing the book was working on the characters that Francis did and not like. <laughs> It's a bit of you working through your childhood traumas, isn't it? It's a bit yes. like therapy in a way. Unpacking in order for you to give advice to others, you had to unpack yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. A gentleman that I was dating at the time, he mentioned that I should go to therapy. And I thought, okay, well, I'll try it out. I've tried it out before, but I really wasn't sure how that di- how that dynamic was going to help. But I am so grateful. I'm so grateful to him for just even mentioning that because he was also a, what do you call it? He he was also a facilitator and learning how to communicate with my children as well. So because of that experience that I had with him, it really helped me to open up myself to not be so rigid in the way that I do things. Yeah. So if I was to ask you, because obviously, who who do you think this book is for? Can you hear me? Who is it for? I think it's for people that are, have behaved in one way for so long <laughs> that now life is asking them to change. And if they feel that they're stuck this is an opportunity for them to find a tool that will help them get unstuck that's a really good one to get unstuck yes. and from how how has the book been been received do you think there's there's a, a part two there's there's another one in you too <laughs> there is actually i'm writing yeah. a prologue to my book on how i got to where i am now because you know as you asked me earlier what's the backstory we all have these different things that affect us. And I think in order for us to really have a full scope of where you are now, we need to know where you came from and how that has affected your thinking. And you see the transition of what was to what is now. 
So the book, the new book that I have coming out is called Victim and Violator. And you'll see the two different dynamics there. And whew, I talk about some things in there that I'm definitely ashamed of uh, having participated in. But once again, if we don't share the whole aspect of what we've been through, you really don't have the full story. You can't be vulnerable. You can't connect with people. And like you said earlier, the whole humanizing. Yes, I'm an author. Yes, I published. But I had to live an experience in order for you to hear this story. And I'm sure it's the same for you. I probably can't live in your shoes if I experienced the life that you lived. We all are given different strengths to live the lives we live so we can be where we are now. Yeah. One of the things I took away from from, from the book was um, taking ownership. So, yes, yes I, I, you know, I, I come from a different 